Welcome to your course, Standing Strong, Building Postnatal Core Strength Through the Feet. My name is Jackie Crockford and I am your host for today's course. Today I am joined by our presenter, Dr. Emily Splickle. Dr. Emily comes to us from New York. She's a podiatrist there and is going to be delivering a great presentation to you about building core strength through the feet. Emily, come on out. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so, Dr. Emily, you have your own practice as a podiatrist in New York. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So, in, a, in addition to being a clinician, I also travel the world educating. Mm -hmm. I focus on barefoot science and teaching what I call foot to core sequencing, mm -hmm. which is part of our focus today, and really try to bring this awareness of how powerful our feet are into our entire body stabilization. Great. So, we are talking specifically about postnatal core strength today, and you're a podiatrist, so help us make the connection, why is that something that we're speaking of today? Yeah, so we think of postnatal, of course we're going to go to core stabilization, mm -hmm. pelvic floor. There's a lot of very interesting gateways into the pelvic floor that actually come from the feet. Mm -hmm. So we're not focusing on foot pain per se, but how uh, I as a podiatrist look at the human movement and human body mm -hmm. from this foot to core pathway. Great, so we are barefoot today because we are talking <laughs> about the feet. So we also have a model, um, our client Jesse today who's gonna be joining us and she is a new mom. Uh, she's yeah. seven weeks postpartum so these exercises are something that can be used for this population. Absolutely appropriate for seven weeks post-pregnancy. Great, so let's get started. Yeah. Excellent. Good, so thank you to everyone who's tuning in. I hope that this is going to be a very exciting opportunity and hopefully a new perspective for you to look at how you can look at some of this postnatal programming. We of course know that focusing on center stabilization, reestablishing deep core stabilization, pelvic floor is important for this population, but I'm gonna try to bring a unique new perspective to look at how you can use the feet into that core stabilization. Now why this is so important is that if you think of functional movement and the functional baseline of these clients, we want to get them upright. So part of being upright means that our feet become our foundation and that foundation needs to talk to your body's center of stabilization. So we're going to be exploring the foundation talking to the core through these fascial pathways and then how you can use breath, focused pelvic floor activation, and then the foot to core sequencing to provide safe and effective programming with the goal of bringing them back to function. So as we get started looking at some of the changes that happen in those postnatal clients, we of course know that there's going to be a lengthening of the abdominals walls, especially as they enter that third trimester. That lengthening of the abdominal wall muscles is going to change the length ten tension relationship of these muscles. So we know altered length tension relationships deactivates muscles. So a large part of what we're focusing on is going to be activation activating and getting into those deep core muscles so that when they start getting to the rest of their programming, they have that foundation. Other changes that we see in pregnancy is that there's going to be a shift in the center of gravity. When you have a shift in the center of gravity, of course, that's going to shift the pelvis. So these, pa or these clients shift into a anterior pelvic tilt or a lordotic curvature. Now, what does that do to their deep core stabilization? When your pelvis shifts into an anterior tilt, you actually put the pelvis in a position that it makes it difficult for the pelvic floor to engage. So we want to be focusing on proper alignment or stacking so that we can put the pelvic floor at an advantage to engage. Another change that we often see is that towards the third trimester is that because of the size of the baby, it's actually restricting their diaphragm. The restriction of the diaphragm is going to change the breathing pattern in these clients. So they're going to start adopting what's called a supradiaphragmatic breathing pattern. Now when your client breathes supradiaphragmatically, it's actually going to destabilize their entire pelvis. Our focus again is getting that baseline stabilization. So reestablishing proper breathing patterns after birth 
is really important. Final change that we see in these populations is that there's obviously a release of relaxin. So relaxin is going to release or uh, relax a lot of the ligaments in the body, which creates hypermobility from the feet to the knees to the pelvis. So we just need to really, again, focus on stabilization. Relaxin levels can actually stay elevated for up to six months after birth. So stabilization is really important for this population. So we're gonna shift into our programming. Of course, we're focusing into our center. So, I want you to think about where is our body's center of stabilization? That is our goal. Before we start moving and getting these postnatal clients moving, we want to think about how they're stabilizing. So, where's our center of stability? You might be thinking here, right? It's actually lower than the belly button. It sits in between the hip bones. So this area is called the lumbopelvic hip complex. Our center of gravity actually lies between the ASIS and in front of our body. So our, our center of gravity is actually out here. Now, part of our stability, being where our center of gravity is, center of stabilization, we want to think about the muscles that we need to engage and activate to create stability here. So there's two ways that we can look at this. We can look at this from a micro stability perspective, or we can look at it from a macro stability perspective. This might be a new way of looking at core stabilization, but I just encourage you to, to come with me a little bit here. So macro stabilizers, typically when we think of core stabilizers, hip stabilizers, you might be thinking about the glutes. Your glutes, large muscles, superficial muscles, you can obviously palpate or touch those muscles. Those muscles, I want you to think of them as macro, macro big, big stabilizer. But on the other side, you also have what are called micro stabilizers. The micro stabilizers, don't just think small, but I want you to think deep. So if I were to ask you, what are the macro stabilizers of the hip? Macro stabilizers of the hip are the glutes. What are the micro stabilizers of the hip? I want you to think, what are the muscles that literally surround your femur inside the hip joint? Those muscles are your deep rotators. So we have our gemelli, we have our obturator, and we have the quadratus femoris. All of these muscles together are referred to as the deep rotators. You can think of them like the rotator cuff of your shoulder. When they contract together, they create what's called tension. Now, tension in muscles actually creates a stiffening or a drawing in effect. So the way that we want to think of the deep rotators and the micro stabilizers of your deep hip is that they're going to draw in the hip joint, creating a layer one of stability. Once we create that stability, then we can start looking at the macro muscles. So another name for microstabilizers, these deep rotators, is local stabilizers. So I'm not sure if you've heard of, maybe you have heard of local versus global stabilizers of the core. If not, just continue exploring. And the most important thing that you want to think of when you think local versus global stabilizers, not just their size. I want you to think the order at which they contract. Stabilization during dynamic movement is built around the coordination of contraction. That's going to be a big part of our programming. So the local stabilizers that we're going to go into, thinking deep core, pelvic floor, multifidi, diaphragm, deep rotators, psoas. So a lot of these micro stabilizers, often referred to as deep core, we're gonna give them the name as local stabilizers. We're also going to give them the name of micro stabilizers. The local stabilizers or the micro stabilizers must contract first. After they contract, then we can switch to the global stabilizers, which are the obliques, the spinalis, your glute medius, so some of the other muscles that you probably focus on in your programming. Local, then global. Now, some of the characteristics of these muscles just to deepen this understanding, is your local stabilizers are going to increase what's called muscle tension or muscle stiffness. 
Now, muscle stiffness or tension is really a fascial term. Tension stiffness is a fascial term. So a lot of these local stabilizers have a very high fascial density. Fascial density, I want you to think of the fascial spider web that surrounds our body. If you've ever heard of tensegrity, tensegrity, tension, integrated tension is a fascial term. Local stabilizers, when they contract, they create tension. The type of muscle contraction that creates tension is isometric. So isometric contractions are going to be the exercise or the cue that we give to our local stabilizers. We're going to see that shortly when we do our programming. Another characteristic of the local stabilizers is that they have a high density of proprioceptors. Proprioceptors is just nerve endings. Anytime a muscle has high density proprioceptors, I want you to start thinking it has to do with posture. Postural muscles have a higher concentration of proprioceptors because they have to constantly be reading the environment to shift for our center of gravity. So those local stabilizers, pelvic floor, diaphragm, psoas, lots of nerve endings, create isometric contractions to create tension, to create stability. And then on the other side, the global stabilizers, think of them much more as our decelerators. They're more eccentric in their contractions. They have less proprioceptors. So again, some of those characteristics helps you to understand why we need to engage local and then global, or micro and then macro. This is gonna go back to foot to core because it's a local stabilization pathway. So we're going into this myofascial connection of the core. Your goal with your postnatal client is how can you reestablish myofascial integration in their center of gravity? So what's it look like? Well, we have our deep rotators. We mentioned those already, right? Those deep rotators, interestingly, are myofascially blended into your pelvic floor. Your pelvic floor myofascially blends into your diaphragm and then coming off of your diaphragm is going to be your psoas. So that connection or that cascade, deep hip, pelvic floor, diaphragm, psoas, has to happen like that. And it has to happen all at once before you start moving. So this coordinated contraction is going to be the focus of our postnatal program. What does this have to do with feet? And why is a podiatrist speaking to you about this? Well, interestingly, your feet are connected to your core. Your feet are connected to these deep stabilizers via what's called the deep front fascia line. The deep front fascia line starts in the bottom of your feet. The long flexors that insert on the tips of your toes actually blend into your adductors. And then your adductors run into what's called your obturator fascia, obturator deep hip, right? And then that blends into the pelvic floor, into the diaphragm, into the psoas, and it actually goes all the way up into the roof of your mouth and your tongue. So if you actually engage your tongue in a certain way, you can get into your core and you can connect to your feet, which is pretty cool. So we're going to be accessing the deep front line, which is a micro stabilization line or a local stabilizer line as part of our postnatal programming. Now, how are we going to start doing this? We are going to start with the pelvic floor. Why we want to start with the pelvic floor is it's going through a lot of stress, especially towards that last end of pregnancy and after delivery. You really need to reconnect with the pelvic floor. You need to reconnect that new mom with engaging and relaxing the pelvic floor. The way that I want you to think of the pelvic floor might be a little bit different than you've thought of it before. We're going to throw away the idea of Kegels. I want you to think of the pelvic floor as an anti-gravity muscle, which means as you engage the pelvic floor, there's going to be a lift. You should actually feel that when you engage the pelvic floor, you have less pressure under your feet because you've just created tension that opposed gravity. And I hope that you'll be able to experience that as we go through the exercises. Now, real quick related to the anatomy as well is that your pelvic floor, 
don't think of it as one muscle. I want you to think of it as an anterior and a posterior. It helps you with the identification of how this muscle engages. You have an anterior pelvic floor. The anterior pelvic floor myofascially blends. It comes up and around, and it myofascially blends into your transverse abdominals. Your posterior pelvic floor actually comes up and it goes into, myofascially blends into, the deep sacral fibers of your glute max. So what this means is if you want higher TVA, transverse abdominals, go through the pelvic floor. If you want higher glute engagement, go through the pelvic floor. All it's also showing is local and then global. So we are going to get into our pelvic floor awareness exercise, our pelvic floor identification, which I'm going to talk you through real quick, and then I'm going to have Jesse come out and we're actually going to do it. So with the pelvic floor identification, we're going to have the client lying on their back. First step always should be, remember the alignment, stack the rib cage to the pelvis. If they are post-pregnancy and have that lordotic curvature, it's actually going to deactivate the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. So maintaining the stacked position, always remember step one. We're then going to be visualizing that the base of the pelvis is like the face of a clock. You're going to be visualizing that the pubic symphysis is 12 o'clock, the tailbone is six o'clock, right ASIS is three o'clock, left ASIS is nine o'clock. When you engage these muscles, you're going to start bringing six o'clock to 12 o'clock. But remember, it's anti-gravity. So you wanna actually draw them together and it's actually a little bit of a lift. You're gonna hold that tension and then when you engage three o'clock to nine o'clock, it's going to be like two bookends coming together. Or you could think like a drawstring pant or short and you pull it, how it's gonna tighten it, okay? So it's no longer cue belly button to the spine. We're going deeper into the pelvic floor and the TVA. Six to 12, three to nine. After we establish that tension, you'll see that I'm gonna cue that Jessie's going to lift her foot. The point of lifting the foot is showing that she has stability and tension it can actually add some resistance and not lose that tension. Are you ready to see the example? I'm gonna have Jesse come on out. Thank you for coming out. I'm gonna have you lie on your back for us. Excellent, great. So, Jesse's going to be in a position with the knees bent and her feet flat on the floor. Step one, remember, stack the rib cage and pelvis. So if you need to put the hands on the client and make sure, if you see any rib cage flaring, that's what you wanna be able to tuck down. So I usually cue, not the pelvis, I don't cue tuck pelvis under or anterior tilt. The cueing that I use is through the rib cage. So if we needed, we would just have her tuck her rib cage down, but you look good, okay? You're gonna place your hands onto your pelvis. Now why I'm having Jessie place her hands on her pelvis is because when you do a pelvic floor engagement, nothing should move. Oftentimes when clients like to see movement and they try to engage their pelvic floor, they squeeze their butt. Now what happens when you engage the glutes, when you're trying to engage the pelvic floor, is they just engaged the macro stabilizer. So we need to retrain their brain essentially to let go the global muscle and stay local. Okay, so you're gonna shut your eyes. Why I'm cueing Jessie to shut her eyes is that when the eyes are shut, she's going to be visualizing the base of her pelvis like a clock. She's going to be visualizing drawing these muscles together. When you use visualization, you actually get higher muscle activation. This is really important when you have a client that has deactivated muscles because of either postnatal, perhaps they had a C-section, or any other injury that they might have experienced. So, Jessie's eyes are shut, her rib cage and her pelvis are stacked, her hands are on her pelvis. She's now going to start visualizing the base of her, of her pelvis like the face of a clock. Her pubic symphysis is 12 o'clock, her tailbone is six o'clock, right ASIS is three o'clock, less ASIS, ASIS is nine o'clock. On her exhalation, so she's gonna do a nice relaxed inhale, and then when she exhales, she's gonna to start to draw six o'clock to 12 o'clock. Just nice and relaxed, keep the exhale moving. You should feel tension. And then she's gonna release it, let it go, and then inhale. So I'm just starting to bring some awareness. Again, when you're ready, start to exhale. 
draw six to 12. She keeps the breath moving the entire time. My hand on her lower abdomen can actually feel tension. And then she's gonna release, let it go, inhale. Good, on the next one we're gonna add three to nine. When you're ready, start to exhale. Six to 12, tension. Keep exhaling, six to nine. Think the bookends coming together, feeling the tension. And then release, let it all go, inhale. Beautiful. On the next one, I'm gonna have her lift her foot. So you're gonna start to exhale. Six, 12, three, nine, tension. Hold the tension, I want you to see your right foot. When you're ready, start to lift your right foot one centimeter off of the floor, keep the tension, beautiful, stay exactly as you are. And then good, when you're ready, bring your right foot down, release the pelvis, and inhale. We're gonna do the other side, and then I'm gonna add another tip. So when you're ready, start to exhale. Six, 12, three, nine, I feel the tension, that's great. Focus on your left foot. When you're ready, lift your left foot, beautiful. Keep that, keep the tension, keep exhaling, good. And then bring your foot down, release everything, let go. Beautiful. So real quick, what I want you to pay attention to, some things that you might see if they're losing the tension, it might be that when they lift the foot, if you can lift your foot for one second, beautiful. So if they lift the foot, this is resistance. If they lift the foot and you see that the stomach pushes out or the pelvis shifts, they've just lost the pelvic floor stability. That means the leg goes down and that's too advanced of an exercise right now. We stay within the 612 and the 39. This of course you can add on to many other exercises. Our focus for step one, new postnatal, new mom, is to reactivate, reconnect the mind muscle awareness to the pelvic floor. Now we're ready for step two. Thank you very much. So step two, we're going to bring this into how it myofascially blends into the diaphragm. Why I started with the pelvic floor is because, again, remember, you're getting this deactivation. You've actually lost some of your identity with the pelvic floor. So I use that as a baseline. I want to reconnect these new moms with the pelvic floor, and then we add in the diaphragm. Because part of reconnecting to the diaphragm uses the pelvic floor. So we're going to proceed into the diaphragm now. Now why diaphragm awareness or diaphragmatic breathing is important is remember that we had said in the beginning, some of the changes that happen in pregnancy is that because of the size of the baby and the shift in the center of gravity, there's really a restriction to the diaphragm. So they're not able to get the full inhalation. They're not able to breathe down into the belly because the baby's taking the space. So they shift into a supra diaphragmatic position. When you look at breathing patterns, there's two main breathing patterns that we want to focus on. You can either breathe above the diaphragm or below the diaphragm. The way that we breathe is actually linked to what's called the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is kind of this internal regulation of how your body is responding to stress and heart rate, blood pressure, the environment, and it's really regulated as what's called sympathetic and parasympathetic, fight or flight, rest and digest, kind of the super basic baseline. When you are in a supra-diaphragmatic breathing pattern above, you are in what's referred to as a sympathetic style. It's stressed, it's anxious, it's really survival. Think of someone who's really anxious, their personality is really anxious, or you're, you're going to something and you're nervous. You typically breathe a little bit more supra-diaphragmatic. We want to shift these moms and these clients into the sub-diaphragmatic. Sub-diaphragmatic is going to focus more on parasympathetic. So this is going to be our rest and digest. So this is putting them in a much more safe zone. Your body from a stabilization perspective cannot be safe if it thinks it's in survival. So that's why breathing is important beyond just literal stabilization, is know that it can carry out. So teaching a new mom diaphragmatic breathing, very powerful. Now some other comorbidities or other things that you wanna look at, not just, okay, do they have an unstable pelvis, but maybe that client, that postnatal client, is complaining of acid reflux. Maybe she's had acid reflux since her pregnancy or even before the pregnancy. It's something that relates back to the diaphragm function. 
So diaphragmatic breathing and looking at the diaphragm isn't just for postnatal, but perhaps they also have the acid reflux. Maybe they breathe out of their mouth. Technically, we're supposed to be breathing out of our nose, which allows optimal diaphragmatic breathing. If they snore at night, you want to focus on diaphragmatic breathing. So there's a lot of different comorbidities that help to point you in the direction to say, I think I need to incorporate diaphragmatic breathing with this client. We're focusing on the postnatal client because of the shifts that happen during that third trimester. So when we go into our diaphragmatic breathing, the way that we're going to cue, this is going to be similar to the pelvic floor. When Jessie comes out in a moment, she's going to be lying on her back in the exact same alignment as before. We're focusing on rib cage and pelvis stacked, but this time we're going to have her place a hand on her sternum and a hand on her abdomen. I'm going to have her initially take nice relaxed breath to see which hand is moving more. If I notice that the hand that's on the sternum is moving a lot more than the hand on the belly, I will know that Jessie's breathing supra diaphragmatic. I'm not going to be able to achieve peak stability if she's breathing supradiaphragmatic. So we're going to have to shift her so that the hand that's on the belly is actually rising and falling with every inhale and exhale. We're then going to have Jessie shift her hands to her rib cage. She's going to continue breathing into the belly and we're going to see that the rib cage expands and releases. It's going to expand laterally and it's going to expand posteriorly. That's going to be the second focus. Your third focus is that she's going to be breathing down into the pelvic floor. This part is really important, especially for the new moms. It's breathing down and actually letting go of the pelvic floor. That is a very big challenge for a lot of new moms because they're trying to hold on to the pelvic floor because it's just got lengthened and deactivated. So they're trying to hold on to anything that they can. But Proper coordination of muscles allows not just the contraction, but also the relaxation. So that's going to be a big focus. Into the belly, into the rib cage, into the pelvic floor. Relax the pelvic floor, and then you feel the pelvic floor rise. We're going to add on to this and put the pelvic floor with the diaphragm into what's called end range expiration. So you're going to see that as well. I'm now going to have Jesse come back out. And we're going to do the diaphragmatic breathing, adding on. So she's going to go onto her back, assuming the same position. Her knees are bent, her feet are flat on the floor. Now, any of these breathing patterns in any of the pelvic floor, you can actually do in different positions. They don't have to be on the back. They could be in a quadruped position. They could be in a seated position. They could, of course, be standing. Technically, I would say to do it in all of them because we need to be able to engage pelvic floor diaphragm in multi different positions. So we are here, rib cage and pelvis is stacked, good alignment, allowing optimal diaphragm and optimal pelvic floor function. I'm going to have you place one hand on your sternum and one hand on your belly. Again, the eyes are going to be shut. Why we want the eyes shut is it's going to allow her to create the visualization of these muscles moving and contracting. Okay, so she's going to inhale through the nose, just nice and relaxed, and then exhale when you're ready. I would cue inhale and exhale through the nose. When we exercise, we shift to inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Why I'm keeping it all through the nose is because this is the activation. So we can use different breathing patterns depending on what the goal is. So again, she's inhaling. I'm feeling her belly rise. I could even put maybe a little bit of pressure on this hand to give her something to connect to. Beautiful, do one more and then good release, good. So if you can move your hands to your rib cage. Now what we're looking for, same thing. So she's gonna continue inhaling. I should still feel or see that her belly is rising, but every time she inhales now, she's gonna feel her rib cage expand. And then she's gonna feel her rib cage coming in. Beautiful, one more. Rib cage is also going posterior and then release. Great, so the third focus is going to be into the pelvic floor. So Jesse, I'm going to have you move your hands wherever you're comfortable. If you want to stay here, you want to go more perfect st sternum in, into the belly. Now her focus is going to be down into the pelvic floor. Belly still rises, 
rib cage is still expanding, but now because her eyes are shut, she can focus and really direct her energy into the base of her pelvis, let go of the pelvic floor. And then when she exhales, the pelvic floor is actually going to rise as her diaphragm rises. So the pattern of breathing, when we inhale, diaphragm goes down, pelvic floor goes down. When we exhale, pelvic floor goes up, diaphragm goes up. So she's maintaining and keeping her breath subdiaphragmatic. This means that she just shifted into a parasympathetic state, a safe state, and a stable state. How we're going to add on from this is going to be diaphragm with the pelvic floor. So remember the clock. So you can have your hands here if you would like. If you want them in the pelvis, it's your choice. Her eyes are still shut. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add on. She's going to inhale through her nose for five seconds. And now during the exhale, she's going to go back to six to 12, three to nine, throughout the entire exhalation. So we'll do a round of that. I'm going to have you inhale when you're ready. Two, three, four, five. And then she's going to exhale for 10 seconds. So start to exhale. Beautiful. See the clock. Draw six to 12. Keep exhaling. Draw three to nine. Keep exhaling. I feel tension underneath my fingers. Beautiful. Eight, nine, 10. And then release. Inhale. Good. So we're just continuing with this. And then exhale when you're ready. Should we go back to the clock? Create the stability. Feel the tension. If she wanted to add a lift of her foot, she could. It's her choice. Or however you feel like you want to progress it. That would be called end range expiration. Beautiful. Now we're ready to go into our third step, which is incorporating your feet now that we've established core stabilization. Thank you so much, Jesse. We'll have you come out again in a moment. So when we look at foot to core stabilization, your foot is like your core, which means that your feet also has deep core, a deep core within your foot. These are referred to as the local stabilizers of your feet, the micro stabilizers of your feet, or often they're the intrinsic muscles of your feet. So on the bottom of your foot, you have small little muscles that act just like the pelvic floor, the diaphragm, the deep rotators. They're packed with proprioceptors. They create tension when they contract. They do an isometric contraction, and they are sequenced through fascia into your deep core. The way that we're going to activate these deep core muscles of your foot, your foot's core, is through an exercise called short foot. Now I'm going to go in real quick how we're going to do short foot, and then we're actually going to go into Jesse doing the short foot exercise, and then how we integrate it with foot core, and then into a series of exercises. So when we do short foot, I always recommend doing one foot at a time. Why I recommend starting with one foot is that it's a very mind-muscle connection, almost like the pelvic floor, how I cued shutting the eyes. It helps to get a higher muscle activation. Here we're going to be doing one foot at a time. Focusing on that one foot, I'm going to have higher activation, and then the progression would be doing short foot on both feet at the same time. We're going to start by finding our foot tripod, so we have an even body weight distribution. We're going to lift the digits, spread them out, and the simple activation of short foot is going to be pushing the tips of the toes down into the ground. Now, that might not seem like a big exercise, but when you push the tips of your toes down into the ground and you match it with an exhale, and you match it with engaging the pelvic floor and lifting it, lifting that clock, you actually establish deep front line stability. We're going to do it in a split stance position. And then as I had said, we're going to progress it into a series of exercises. So I'm going to have Jesse come back out. And we're going to show them how we're going to engage short foot. So I'm going to have you bring your right leg forward and your left leg back. Great, so she's in a split stance position. Why we're doing this position is that it's actually mimicking gait. So I want her to be in kind of that reciprocal pattern of walking, which is the baseline of functional movement for these clients. Good. So we're directing all of her energy into her right foot. She's going to find her foot tripod. So underneath the first metatarsal head, the fifth metatarsal head, and the heel. So one, two, three. Lift your toes. Spread them out as wide as you can. 
Place them back down onto the floor. Excellent. Keep this knee soft. Beautiful. And then you're going to push the tips of your toes down into the ground. Good. So she's essentially anchoring her foot into the ground. When she does that, she may feel the muscles in the bottom of her feet engage. She might feel that her arch is lifting. And then good. Relax. Beautiful. And then we're going to do one more. When you're ready, push the tips of the toes down into the ground. Hold there. If I put my hand underneath her foot, I can actually feel the intrinsic muscles of the feet engage. And then good. Relax. Beautiful. Switch to the other side. We're going to assume the same position. She's still in that same split stance. Beautiful. Her knee is soft so that we're protecting her meniscus. She's finding her foot tripod. She's spreading her toes nice and wide. Excellent. And then when you're ready, you're going to push the tips of your toes down into the ground. Good. Hold that. So right now, she's holding in an isometric contraction. Isometrics, remember, match local stabilizers. Isometrics is how you actually activate muscles. And then relax your foot. We're going to do one more. Push the tips of your toes down into the ground. You might see that her arch is lifting. When you push the toes down, the arch is going to start to lift. I can feel these muscles engaging, which is great. And then relax. Good. Bring your right leg forward again. And now what we're going to do is I want to incorporate both feet because we're in a split stance position. So we're going to bring awareness to the front foot and the back foot. Okay. As I had said, if you do one foot at a time, that's actually your baseline. When you add two feet, that's going to be a progression. So her front foot and her back foot. So I want you to find the tri tripod on both of them, spreading the toes. Good. So think of them as two separate feet. On your right foot, push the tips of your toes down into the ground. Beautiful. Feel that foot engage. Hold it. And now I want you to do the same thing to your back foot. Push your left toes into the ground. Excellent. Do you feel like you're kind of solid in that foundation? Yes. Beautiful. Now relax your feet. Good. We're going to do that one more time. Engage your right foot. Excellent. I feel the arch starting to lift. That's a great lift of the arch. Push your left foot down. She's connecting and rooting her entire foundation down into the ground. And then release it. Good. Switch to the other side. And then we're going to add in the core. Same position. Same alignment. Knees are soft. If you feel like they're getting into too, too far, you can go wider, right? You, so you can kind of vary some of that alignment. Foot tripod on the front. Foot tripod on the back. When you're ready, engage your left foot. Toes go down. I feel the muscles engage. Excellent. Go to your right foot. Push down. You should feel engage, engage, and then release both. Good. One more time. Engage your left. Arch lifted. Go to your right. Boom. Arch lifted. Rock into your foundation, and then good release. Beautiful. Go to your right side again. So that's really going into the baseline of short foot. Foot activation, foot awareness. Just like we had to do pelvic floor identification, and a lot of our clients, if they're not used to training barefoot or they're not used to engaging their feet, you're going to have to do a foot awareness exercise, which is what that first exercise was or short foot is. Now we need to sequence it. If your client has strong feet and a strong core, but they're not sequenced and they're not talking to each other, they're not functionally stable. So we're going to be adding in the core. So what I want you to do is go back to the clock. Remember the clock, the base of the pelvis, 12 o'clock, 6, 3, 9. Okay, your knee is bent. Find your tripod on your first foot or your front foot. Excellent. Now find the clock and start to draw at 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Good. Hold, draw 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Feel the tension, hold that tension, and now push your right toes down into the ground. Do you feel that they are kind of talking to each other? Yes. Good. And then release, let them both go. Again, she would match her exhale. So start to exhale, 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Keep exhaling, draw 3 to 9. Increase tension, keep exhaling. Push your right toes down into the ground, good. Keep that connection, keep the exhale. Feel like they're talking to each other. And then good, release, let them both go. Good, other side. On this other side, we're going to add both feet to it. So we're going to do one foot at a time when we're adding it in, OK? So same thing here, even when she's standing, stay stacked, okay? So you, you are stacked, but we just want to make sure rib cage and pelvis are staying in alignment. So she's back to her clock. She's on the foot tripod on both feet. When you're ready, you're going to start to exhale. 6, 12, 3, 9, keep the tension. Now push your left toes down into the ground. Hold that tension. Push your right toes down into the ground. And then good release, okay? So I want it to be one, 
two, three. Okay, when you're ready, start to exhale. Six, 12, three, nine, tension, hold. Add your left foot, add your right foot. Feel the tension, keep, just keep holding it. You should feel like it's kind of talking to each other. Do you feel that? Excellent, good. And then release. Okay, so that's just an awareness. That's just an activation that's creating her foundation. Once you establish that foundation, now you can bring it into movement. You can bring it into different exercises. So we're going to have Jesse do a couple different exercises. We're going to do three, one in each plane, just to show how you would integrate it. The most important thing when we do these exercises is you want to ask yourself, where is short foot? Where is the pelvic floor? And where's the exhale? That's what I'm going to be looking for, okay? It's going to be wherever you need that peak stability. First exercise is going to be the reverse lunge into a single leg squat. If we didn't want to do a single leg squat, she could come up into a kickstand. She's ready to push it, so she's going to go all the way into a single leg stance or a single leg squat. Excellent. She inhales when she goes back. When she comes forward, I want her to push those toes down and then go back, inhale, relax the foot, exhale in, engage the core. Inhale when she goes back, one last time, exhale, bring it up, hold here, stay here, keep the core, she's doing the exhale, she's pushing her toes down into the ground. Excellent. So it wasn't just reverse lunge to single leg squat, it was where's the short foot, where's the pelvic floor, where's the exhale. Second exercise is going to be a side lunge in the frontal plane. So as she's coming out, when she goes into that side lunge position, she's actually lengthening her pelvic floor, which means she's going to follow it with an engagement of the pelvic floor. Relax the pelvic floor when she's out, engage the pelvic floor when she comes up, but every time she comes back up, she's engaging her feet. Exhale, bring it up, push your toes into the ground. Do one more. Inhale out, she could relax her foot. Exhale, come up, push the toes down. Beautiful, excellent. Our third exercise in the transverse plane is going to be a bowler squat. Same pattern. Inhale when you're out, exhale when you're back. Ready? Excellent. So she's inhaling, she's exhaling here. Inhale when she goes out, exhale when she comes in. Her awareness while she's doing these repetitions is not just how many repetitions am I doing. Her awareness is every time she comes back to here. She is stable through foot to core sequencing. We'll do one more. Beautiful, good. So she's there, she's making that accent point on that single leg stance, foot to core. When you brought it back every time, were you able to feel your feet and your core connecting? Yes. Excellent, good. And then she should feel a sensation of stability. Thank you so much. All right, so all of those exercises were very safe. If we wanted to keep Jessie just at the awareness exercise, just had her focus on pelvic floor and diaphragmatic breathing, we could have kept her there. But we decided to bring her up. We brought her up standing into gravity, and we wanted her to connect her foot core into her core core so that we can create foot to core stability. Again, I cannot emphasize enough that we're doing this through the awareness of short foot, pelvic floor, remember the clock, and the exhale. I would probably even go so far as to say that every time you come back to that repetition, shh, With that exhale, you are forcing pelvic floor foot stabilization. So how can you safely build this into your client programming? How can you progress that new mom back to that functional level that she used to be. Well, this programming is built around first having, of course, medical clearance. Once they're medically cleared, you want to start first focusing on pelvic floor awareness several times a day, not just when these clients are with you, but several times a day. You want to be doing diaphragmatic breathing. You want to follow that diaphragmatic breathing with the clock. 12, 6, 12, 3, 9, the awareness. You can start to add lifting of the foot. You're just keeping them on their back the entire time. Totally fine. When you're ready, you're going to start incorporating the foot, short foot, into the standing non-impact exercises. When you're ready, you're going to start to safely progress foot to core sequencing into more dynamic movement and movement that involves impact. 
Now, if you progress these clients too quickly, you will see that they go from local and they switch and they become very globally dominant. We want to make sure that these clients are not moving globally. What I see all too often in my office is that new moms trying to get back, they want to lose the baby weight and they go into running, which is maybe what they did before they were pregnant but they didn't reestablish local stabilization and foot to core sequencing. And unfortunately they got hurt because they were relying on their global stabilizers. It is slow and it is progressive, but we need to start local stabilization built around the foundation of deep core pelvic floor, how it sequences with the diaphragm and then how that sequences with our feet. And that is your foundation to achieving functional movement in these postnatal clients. Thank you guys so much. I hope that you enjoyed. I'm gonna invite Jackie to come back on. Thank you, Emily, very You're much. Welcome. And thank you to Jessie. She is um, doing a great job. And like we said, seven weeks postpartum. And so she is the perfect client for these types of exercises. Yep, and all very safe for her at this level. Great. So we do have a few moments for some questions. So be sure to type your questions into your YouTube viewer chat bar, and we'll take those in just a few moments. If we do have more questions afterwards, um, on your screen you will see some contact information for Dr. Emily. So you can make sure and touch base with her if you have other questions about the feet specifically mm -hmm. as a podiatrist and also as well as um, women's health from, from your perspective as well, right? Yeah, I try to give a different unique perspective. Even though I'm a podiatrist, I really consider myself more of a movement specialist. Mm -hmm. So I look at the entire body even though I might see patients for foot pain. Right, exactly. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So make sure and contact Dr. Emily. Also, we will be having a live Facebook chat. And if we miss your question today, make sure to go onto our ACE Fitness Facebook page, and we will be taking questions there for Dr. Emily to get back to you on those as well. Um, if you do like this information, we have more courses for you available at ACE. One of them is presented by Dr. Emily herself, as well as a few other courses related to pre and postnatal fitness. So make sure and check those out if you're wanting CECs around this same topic. So let's get to some of those questions. Um, one of the questions that has come through, we, we recognize that uh, our model today, Jessie, is a new mom. So these exercises were safe for her to do today. What is your take on these exercises for moms who may be a little bit um, longer past seven weeks, six months, a year postpartum? Yep, all of these exercises, even if it's someone who has given birth 10 years ago, <laughs> they might have to start at this baseline. Okay. I've definitely had clients, had patients who had recurrent issues because they never did this baseline reactivation of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor. And unfortunately, it just carried out into compensation, compensation, and then they didn't know that the underlying factor was that their pelvic floor was underactive. Mm -hmm. So had they done it, they obviously would have avoided all of it. So don't think, oh, if they're you know 10 years past, oh, we kind of fly past this step, I mean, I use this for, this is the reestablished activation for almost all of my patients. Mm -hmm. Huge, Im important in postnatal, but not just postnatal. Right, and you yeah. mentioned the parasympathetic and sympathetic breathing patterns yeah. that many of us in our crazy busy lives, we automatically go to that sympathetic breathing pattern, right? Yeah. So reestablishing that is good. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's what I love with workshops with, like this, is that you can use it, perhaps your initial interest was postnatal, but you're gonna realize, I can use this on myself, I can use this on so many of my clients, and it's, it's really powerful stuff. Great, great. Um, we did have a lot of great comments about making that mind to muscle, mm -hmm. mind body connection, so that's an important part. When, um, if we have a client who has medical clearance, you mentioned that that's an important piece of making sure that they're ready. Is there a certain period of time that this is best to implement postpartum? Right, so I, I would honestly do it before the medical clearance, only in the sense of the awareness. Mm -hmm. If you're teaching them diaphragmatic breathing and they're immediately post-birth, I mean, you have to breathe. So you're immediately off the gate creating proper patterning, mm -hmm. right? And then that's really going to get that new mom where she needs to be. If you wait, really the medical clearance is for 
like little exercise, mm -hmm. like more impact. Mm -hmm. So waiting to that point, sure, you could wait for that with more the dynamic movement. Mm -hmm. But if you teach them these healthy reactivation patterns before they give birth and they do it immediately after, honestly, that's where they're going to get the fastest. Right. Yeah, almost like prehab. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So before they give birth to really make that mind-body connection and have the awareness. Yeah. So then afterwards, it's already been established. Yeah, 100%. Great. So we have a client today that um, had a cesarean section and this was appropriate for her. What else do we need to know about that type of birth? Yes. So not only with the cesarean section, are you cutting into the abdomen and the abdominal muscles? But I want you to think of the scar mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. So scars are a huge site of deactivation and compensation because you're cutting into so many nerves, the superficial nerves in the skin. If you don't release the scar or you get adhesions in the scar or you get keloids or hypertrophic scarring, right? You can actually knot in a nerve one is painful, but it also keeps misfiring the abs. Okay. Whatever muscles under that incision is gonna keep misfiring them. Mm -hmm. So immediately off the gate, hopefully Jesse's doing it, is getting into the scar and releasing it and taking away and preventing any of that hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. But then if they are getting compensation, they have to release the scar and then immediately do the pelvic floor activation. Mm -hmm. Great. So perfect to understand where your client's coming from, kind of a little bit more of their medical history to make sure that these exercises or any contraindications are, are assumed and, and noted. Right. right, yeah. So if you do have any more questions for Dr. Emily, remember we are doing our live Facebook chat on Ace Fitness Facebook page. You can go there right now or in just a few moments to type in your question for Dr. Emily and she will be answering those over the next few days. Reminder that if you would like to receive CECs for today's presentation, you can follow the guide that is on your slide right now going to our online courses, our free webinars, and you can purchase the course there. Once you purchase, you will receive a recorded version within your My Ace account and you will receive a quiz. Once you pass the quiz, you will be awarded the 0.1 CECs within your My Ace account. Also, join us next month for our next live webinar. We will be joined by Dr. Jim Skinner, who's going to be talking with us about diabetes and exercise and making the connection there. Make sure you sign up for that on our live webinars page at acefitness.org. Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. We look forward to having you here for our next live webinar. Make sure that you contact us with any feedback, any thoughts, and, and opinions about today's course, make sure to check out that live Facebook feed for Dr. Emily. Thank you for joining us. Let's get people moving.